dando início aos nossos trabalhos, como sempre nos últimos, nas últimas três edições dos nossos congressos, nós temos a, a honra e a alegria de contar com a ajuda e a, o protagonismo da nossa fundação partidária, da Fundação Perseu Abramo, na organização de uma conferência internacional. É um momento muito importante sempre para os nossos congressos, na medida em que nós podemos confraternizar, trocar experiências e, ao mesmo tempo, também uh, compartilhar os momentos dos congressos do PT, que para os nossos... Moments, because for our international guests, it's always very interesting to, I feel, I believe, uh, to come here and observe our congresses. So, to begin our work this afternoon, I want to ask to join the panel our comrade Fernando Haddad, former mayor of Sao Paulo, our presidential candidate uh, in 2018, last year. And our dear president of the Workers' Party, national president of the Workers' Party, Glazy Hoffman. I also wish to uh, invite our dear international guests because as always we are running late so to uh, uh, save some time we're going to go straight to the the panel mm, discussion so that after uh, Fernando Adagi and Glazy Hoffman uh, have uh, say their opening remarks, then we go straight over to our dear uh, international guests of the first panel, okay? So, um, our conference will discuss two main themes, a discussion, a reflection about the state of democracy today, which is the first panel, the reflection of the first panel, and the second panel, which will deal with the question of the environmental crisis, the depletion of the Amazon, global warming, and international actions uh, with regard to these questions. So these were suggested by the Special Abramo Foundation. We consider they are the most um, topical uh, debates that are necessary uh, today. So to join the panel about the state of democracy, panelists are very dear. Comrade President Dilma Rousseff, I also wish to call to join our panel our Comrade Jean Marc Germain, Secretary of International Relations and Globalization of the French Socialist Party. I also wish to invite one uh, one more great friend of ours, which is with Jorge Tayana, who is a member of Congress uh, of the Southern Cone Parliament, the Mercosur Parliament, and a former Minister of Foreign Affairs of uh, Argentina during the Kirchner presidency. And lastly, our uh, former, our comrade, former Prime Minister of Spain, Jorge Luis Zapatero. So I wish to say that Celso Amorim, former Minister of Foreign Affairs of Brazil, he had to stay at the Lula Institute to accompany the President Lula, who was there welcoming some authorities there. So he sends his apologies. Once he's done, he'll join us, and we will uh, let him uh, address the hall. 
Lastly, I want to invite the coordinator, the chair of this panel, who is our comrade Rosana Ramos, member of the board of the Perseo Abramo Foundation, and who is who is sponsoring, let's say, this international conference in conjunction with us, the Workers' Party. Okay. Hosanna, please. Hosanna, you can you can join the panel. So, so for their brief opening remarks, I want to invite uh, our comrade Fernando Adagi, former mayor of São Paulo, former presidential candidate. That it's over to you now, Fernando. <laughs> Over there? Okay. okay. I want to greet all the representatives of the of the panel. A special greeting to Sapatero and Dilma Hussef who really add some glamour to our panel. So I want to uh, greet all the delegations present here, uh, all the brothers and sisters, comrades, friends from uh, sister and brother parties uh, of Brazil. So just a brief uh, greeting from me to welcome everyone, but I want to take this opportunity to raise uh, an issue that all Latin American problems are facing right now, uh, a challenge that I believe the Workers' Party Congress may address. We had a decade, or over a decade, at the start of this millennium, where there was a major paradigm shift in our continent. There was a coalition of efforts, let's say, a, a conjugation of factors that came together to benefit enormously the peoples, especially the most vulnerable, the poorer parts of the populations of the countries of Latin America. This conjunction of factors, this coming together of conditions implied on the one hand an appreciation of the value, uh, an appreciation of the value of what we exported, which uh, brought greater uh, export revenues to our continent, but this in conjunction with the fact that Many of our countries were governed by parties committed with a social cause. And this conjugation of efforts created a, a paradigm that had major reach, lasted more than a decade, which meant lifting out of poverty significant uh, proportions uh, of poor and extremely poor uh, people on our continent. This model, uh, at one, in a certain sense, has become exhausted because of everything that happened across the world since 2012, 2013, not from the point of view, both from the point of view of electoral politics, but also from the social point of view. So the degrees of, lidish, of liberty, of freedom, have been reduced. So now we have to put back on the agenda of our countries a new conjugation of factors that allow us, that may allow us to go back to a situation of growth and distribution of incomes, wealth, and opportunities. We can not in any way because of a change in the setting which has structural elements of global financial capitalism. We can in no way abdicate from our vocation, which is to improve the lot of our peoples of our region for the better. That demands an intellectual effort. It, it demands also activism, militancy, critical reflection, um, taking stock. But above all, we must be ready for the struggle. We must take on the fight. That we do have. So with the contribution of brothers and sisters, comrades, friends from all over the world that are here at our, con our Congress, all the workers that come to our Congress from all over Brazil, that we will be able 
starting from the Congress, because the discussion does not end at the Congress, right? But starting off from the Congress, we may be able, able to offer a new paradigm of inclusive development across our region. We will not uh, be able to rely any longer on what happened at the start of this century. Perhaps we shouldn't even uh, rely on this possibility, but we should understand that without a radicalization of the integration of our countries, it will be very hard for each country in isolation to be able to find a recipe for its internal problems, for its domestic problems. It is clear that there are specificities to be considered in each country, but we cannot abdicate from a daring, a bold integration project for our subcontinent, which will mean uh, a recovery of hope, of the possibility of realizing dreams for our populations that are being so mistreated by neoliberal governments, particularly in the last few years in countries as important as Brazil, Chile, Argentina, that uh, now we know Argentina has a different uh, path ahead. We are all very glad with Alberto Fernandes' electoral victory in Argentina. We hope there is a consolidation of this trend of rejecting neoliberal practices, the most cruel practices that place on the worker's shoulders all the weight of the adjustment that the market considers important for the process of capital accumulation to uh, take uh, on again its previous dynamic. We, uh, we take the view that there are other ways, other paths ahead to be taken that distribute in a fairer way the sacrifices that must be made, but must be made by the richer uh, layers of a population which are the ones that contribute the least or have least contributed historically in the de in the decisive crisis moments when our economic and social development has been uh, question in, in question so I hope that with the opening of the Congress and the presence of President Lula we can have a major uh, couple of days of debate for Latin America to be able to go back to giving its contribution to inclusive development across the world. Thank you very much. Thank you, my dear mayor. Me, uh, in this role as MC, I am a disaster. So <laughs> I want to take this occasion to say that this conference is being streamed online, online, streamed online. Let's get the help from the youngsters. What's the proper name? Okay, in your uh, brochure, the uh, address is there, the, the web address is there. So if you uh, can maybe post this address so that your contacts, your networks, on social media can uh, have uh, access to the content of our conference via the streaming um, link, okay? So, now I want to hand over to President Glazy Hoffman, President of the Workers' Party, for her opening uh, remarks in, on behalf of the Workers' Party. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to this international conference that precedes the opening of our seventh national congress. I want to greet in the name of all the membership of the Workers' Party, the international delegations, and above all, express our gratitude for the solidarity, for the support, for the presence in the tough moments we've experienced in the recent years uh, after the 2016 coup with the fraudulent impeachment of President Dilma. After that, the imprisonment of our comrade, former President Lula. 
it was fundamental. The international support was fundamental. We received solidarity from many leaders across the world. President Lula received the visit of many world leaders, and we were able to say to um, motivate many jurists to uh, express their views about the suit that Lula was subjected to, based on fake, uh, false premises, uh, and with all, with no evidence, leading to his imprisonment in a very very unfair fashion. And this became clear after The Intercept published the uh, dialogues uh, between the prosecutor, the chief prosecutor, and the judge of the suit. So, so we have here our international relations secretary, Monica Valenci, our comrade, Fernando Haddad, my brother, who's a, my fellow opener of the Congress. And so I greet Jean-Marc Germain, uh, Rodriguez Zapatero, uh, former President Dilma, Jorge Tayana, member of the Mercosur Parliament, former uh, uh, foreign secretary, foreign minister of Argentina. So it's a pleasure to have you all among us. Thank you for coming. I want to tell you that the freedom of President Lula, uh, although it isn't the freedom that we would like, that we wanted, we wanted his innocence, the annulment of the, of the suit, but the freedom that he has now brings us the hope that we will be able to uh, deepen the struggle and the resistance in Brazil. But I also be believe that Lula's freedom inspires the struggle all over Latin America. And he's the main people's leader of our history. And with Lula, the Brazilian people's hope was also arrested. So when he comes out, he renews that hope and brings us the conditions of having a more effective, much more sharp, much more qualified uh, opposition because he is like an echo chamber for the needs of Brazilian people and the need to fight and to confront uh, the government. So the struggle for Lula's freedom that you helped build and were so grateful for that, it had this importance of placing, um, of, of bringing to the struggle, a major leader to confront perhaps the worst government we've ever had in our country, an extremely right-wing government that is uh, taking forward, that is conducting one of the most cruel government uh, programs uh, with the Brazilian people. Uh, this neoliberal wave is not only a Brazilian thing, not only a Latin American thing, but here the effects are greater uh, on the population, on people's lives. It's not for no other reason that we're witnessing major demonstrations in Chile, now in Colombia, Ecuador, an attempt at a coup, in, a successful coup attempt in Bolivia, uh, also in Venezuela, the attempt to intervene in internal affairs and what is happening in Brazil. So we have to unite the, the struggle of the peoples and to confront this in a pointed, targeted fashion. And I greet especially the Argentinian people for developing, for defeating Macri and electing Alberto and Cristina. To us, that is a reference, a very important uh, milestone. Hopefully, we can build a similar path forward, not just in Brazil, but in all over Latin America, uh, all the countries that are having to confront neoliberalism. So please feel most welcome. We'll be together until this evening. Thank you very much for being here and restating the fact that your presence strengthens us in our struggle. This way of having this fellowship, this brotherhood, sisterhood helps us to uh, uh, confront the difficult times we are experiencing. Thank you very much. Welcome once again. carry on as the disastrous MC. I would like to acknowledge some of uh, the participants and thank you. And remember that all our international guests uh, are going to be announced uh, tonight 
at the opening with President Luna tonight. So I would like to acknowledge the presence of Senator Humberto Costa uh, from the state of Pernambuco, uh, from the Workers' Party, Senator uh, Jax Wagner, our senator of the Workers' Party from the state of Bahia, uh, two terms in as governor of uh, Bahia, our dear federal representative from the state of Paraná, Enio Veri, that is also honoring us with his attendance. Our dear Senator Pimentel, that is also here, Senator from the state of Sierra, and our dear Secretary of International Relations of uh, Luis Eduardo Ginhauk of uh, President Dilma. And we thank you very much. And he did excellent work, and he is doing excellent work in the defense of President Lula. Uh, probably I, uh, have, uh, I am missing someone. You know, I'm old. <laughs> oh, our leader of the Workers' Party, Paulo Pimenta, uh, who is here. Thank you, Representative Paulo. Walter Sorrentino, our International Secretary for the Communist Party of Brazil, a fantastic partner for the Forum of Sao Paulo, and our Latin American uh, fight. And then Rosanna later on is going to announce everyone else. Uh, I, I'm a poor MC, I'm, I'm saying, and I'm also slightly blind, so I cannot see everyone. You will forgive me. So thank you very much. And now I'm going to turn the floor to Rosanna Ramos, that is director of the Purcell Abramo Foundation, and is going to coordinate the panel uh, now. So thank you very much. Let's just let them go. Thanks, Monica. Well, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Without any further ado, we are going to start. We had a small delay. And so we are going to start to Jean-Marc German, Secretary of International Relations and Globalization from PS, from France. Please, you can take the floor. Compañeros, compañeras, dear comrades, I'm very happy to be uh, with you today and to deal with this very important issue for this first panel about uh, where is democracy, where does democracy do, and what would the left could be able to uh, face the most difficulty that we encounter. Let's first acknowledge with Francis Fukuyama that he was wrong when he was at the beginning of the 80s uh, saying that we were reaching the end of the history with a victory of democracy and liberalism. As a matter of fact, economic liberalism has failed while today in the world there are together more authoritarian regimes and country ongoing democratic regression and truly democratic countries. So we know that for sure democracy is not for sure precisely and Brazil is a blatant example. As the negative trend is global when we look at the United States of America today with policy including the trade war that Washington is imposing to the world with the authoritarian states, capitalism of China, or whereas Russia is more than ever convincing that its power outside cannot be reached with democratic rights inside. Even in Europe, the trends are preoccupying and there are many countries that go against democratic standards and the rule of law. Let's see the situation in Hungary or Poland, for example. Imagine that even in France, my country, my own country, one year ago, a few weeks before the appearance of the Yellow Jacket movement, more than 41% people would answer in the pool that they were in favor of instauring in France an authoritarian regime. Nevertheless, throughout the world, there are also many examples where people were 
comrades are fighting, and I would like, in your name, to greet our, our friends from Chile to Hong Kong, from Algeria to Beirut, from Tehran to Baghdad, who are fought fighting uh, for rights in their own country. And I will not uh, forget African continent, where they are still ruled for decades by the same derision. But the most surprising, maybe, is that in the most advanced country, even in them, people say that they have lost the truth in democracy. I've mentioned the surveys in France saying that 41% of people are looking uh, authoritarian uh, government not as a threat, but at the same time, they think that 54% of the power is in the hands of financial market and not of the government. Our analysis is that for every single country at a certain stage of development, when the social democracy and welfare state has provided all the mechanisms to reduce the inequalities and to ensure equal rights and service, public services, then another cycle opens. That is the moment precisely when people do not see anymore to, to find the meaning of democracy. That is the moment when social policies are not perceived anyone as relevant for the majority, the minority being accused of abusing. That is the ideal moment for the liberal discourse to push as much as possible the economic liberties till the time when the state itself loses control of government's tool which uses to make it a welfare state. For example, the annual indexes published by conservative organizations place Hong Kong or Chile as the most free countries in the world. In the ne neoliberal cultural environment imposed by the world, we know that a welfare state, political change, and democratic freedoms are viewed with suspicion because they are variable that they can potentially disrupt the law of their market. Therefore, liberalism means the rise of inequalities and the stripping of prerogative of states in their ability to apply fiscal policies and redistribute. And in the face of social injustice, that it perpetrates, liberalism opens the ways to the extreme right. Both liberalism and extreme rights complement each other. Like in France, where Marine Le Pen does not need to speak too much to reach today 45% of intention of vote in the poll. And when the extreme right denounces the so-called ruling of uh, technocratic el elitism. But if she would succeed to be elected, and I, ho I hope it would not be the same, it would be the same as in Brazil, serving and preserving the private financial inter interest that it had denounced to go to power. The extreme rights can hide behind many forms, but at the end, it is the ally of liberalism and the enemy of democracy. So again, those who try to limit the so-called democratic debate and to limit the debate and to go the debate to national in, in the identity issues and to the mind closing, I am pleading for attacking the evil by the roots against liberalism in order to regain the control of our lives. Thus, we can say with certainty that economic liberalism is that feed democracy's crisis and there is a crisis of disrupt towards democracy, democratic institutions and political representatives. So I will conclude just by a few words and maybe a few recommendations for us as left party to tackle this issue. If the, responsible, the main responsibility for the democratic, democratic crisis is liberalism. 
we have to tackle the issue of liberalism. We have to answer the question why people are not voting for parties as our parties that want to redistribute the wealth. And the answer is that they believe at the moment to a fairy tale. The fairy tale is a trickle down theory, a theory that if you give people to rich people, your situation will be better because money will flow to uh, yourself. So we have to win the cultural battle. And then we have to find common solutions. And in a global world, common solutions are global. We have two main issues to address. Because we want welfare states, we want a world welfare state. We have to first answer the, the question of how do we raise tax in a global world. And the second question to achieve welfare state, because we want people to, to feel better in their life, is how do we improve welfare? How do we improve well-being in a finite world and that leads to the env environmental uh, issues? And if we want to find common solution, common taxes, common solution for uh, environmental issue, then we, we, we need more multilateralism. We need more as left party, as trade union, as civil uh, society. We, may, we need more what we call internationalism. We need a new internationalism. And that will be my last word because the problem are global. What we need is not globalized economy and local power. We need to globalize politics and to renational the economy. Thank you very much, dear comrades. Gracias. Eh, Vou chamar o Jorge Tayana, deputado do Parlamento do Mercosul e ex-ministro das Relações Exteriores. Jorge. Good afternoon, everyone. It is a pleasure to be here to bring two joys to the Argentinian people. The first is uh, the electoral triumph of defeating, defeating in the ballots the new liberal project of President Macri and of the major financial centers. This is a joy, and it is work that uh, counted on the help of many of those that are here today to share and think of new pathways. We were defeated in the path electorally, and in four years, we're able to reverse the defeat, learn from our errors, and build a new future. The second joy is the joy of the Argentinian people to know that Lula is free. We feel from our hearts that we know of Lula's generosity, of uh, his example as a human being, but how important uh, it is his policy for the region. Lula free is a triumph for the Argentinian people. It makes uh, us closer to a fairer, freer, and more integrated region. With regard to the situation, I agree with what was said. I believe that we need more multilateralism. We have to face global problems. We are facing a technological revolution that is changing uh, the world today. We are going through change in the relationships of powers, and all that is also close to another extraordinary revolution that not everyone is paying attention, which is the revolution of women, of equality, of our world population 
that was later, earlier submitted to patriarchism. This is a movement that we see everywhere. In all the cities, we meet the companions and we see what is going on. 30 years after the fall of the Berlin Wall, with uh, that uh, promise of liberalism and the promise of neoliberalism brought uh, just the financialization of uh, the society and a distance from the political society to civil society and also a impoverishedness of uh, people and a lack of future for the, the crisis of liberal democracy is closely connected to its sins. Its sins in having consented to the destruction of uh, fundamental rights and also what made many of Latin American regions live in peace. In our region, we have uh, other elements that have to be taken into consideration. We have uh, a dispute of privileges, privileges that have not gone away in popular governments of the region were united to the United States to recolonize, recolonize this region and impose uh, an iron control that had been lost, trying to remove the autonomy that was gained during popular government. They want to restore their historical rights. We say that Latin America, and especially South America, are a territory that is under dispute. And this territory under dispute is going to be gained by us. And we have to learn with that. We have to learn from our recent history. We have to learn from the things that we did right and the things that we did wrong. The main limitation that we had, which is true, is that we improved the living conditions of many people. We improved the distribution of income, employment, health, education, but we were not able to develop a production matrix that is still focused on extractivism, the transportation of commodities, and the concentration of wealth. And as we go deeper into our integration and into a model of development, we have to think that we have to be environmental sustainable. And when we get that, it is going to be very difficult to reverse the situation that we have to achieve a more mature society. And not only in economy that we have to refocus. Also in the political sphere, we need a political strength that is participative, that is closer to people's lives, that is more democratic, that is more in line with uh, the networked world that recognizes the diversity, that encourages the participation of all sectors. There's no way to win the privileged few, the powerful, the financiers, if there's no participation, if there's no organization, if there's no unity. So I conclude, therefore, with a final point, which is the question of unity. One of the reasons for our electoral victory in Argentina was that we set about to build unity. And building unity is not easy. Some comrades were saying we have to unite until it hurts. We have to unite with things that are different from us. That unity, which is a convergence of political forces, has to recognize two basic principles. Firstly, 
we unite because we need to defeat a project which is against the interests of the majority of the people. And we will subordinate everything to that, everything to that aim. So all efforts of unity to defeat the representatives of this financial world, oligarchical world, and this unity is not homogenous. It's not an identity. We're not we're not all the same and we're not going to be the same. There are different experiences, different colorings, let's say, made up of different political sectors, different social movements, different regions, and with all of these that we have to build together a political force that is dynamic, but it's flexible, that is broad-based, centered on the key points that allow us to recover a project of well-being, of welfare for the majority of our population. So we should, firstly and above all, def defend the rights. We must not take a step back on the issue of people's rights. Every time we fight for a workplace, every debate about a bill that wants to take away people's rights, in any and every conflict we have to be present to defend rights, to make it harder for the other side to make any kind of advance, to demonstrate that we will not be beaten, at least not easily. So we have to be broad-based and work in unity and respecting diversity. So with this slogan in mind, we were able to defeat neoliberalism and starting the December the 10th, we will open up a new period of hope. We are sure that in the Congress of the Workers' Party, we will have, we'll be laying the foundations for another Brazil with freedom, with progress, with freedom, with hope, and working strongly for the integration of the region. Long live Brazil, long live Argentina, long live integration, long live solidarity between all the peoples of the world. Thank you, brothers. Thank you, sisters. Thank you, Tayana. OK, now I can announce the presence of former Minister of Foreign Affairs and of Defense of Brazil, Celso Morin, who chairs the International Free Lula Committee. So now I want to call on Jose Luis Rodriguez Zapatero for his remarks, former Prime Minister of Spain. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much to the Workers' Party for the invitation. To me, it's very emotional. This morning, I was able to give President Lula a hug. And if Lula is free, we are all a little freer because of that. So I, when I was Prime Minister of Spain, Lula was president, so we worked together on many projects at the time in the fight against hunger. I can tell you to the, to the pride of Brazil and the Workers' Party that I've not met a political leader in all my trajectory that did more in favor of the poor to abolish poverty and to limit wealth. That's Lula. That's Lula for you. And in fact, the Workers' Party, uh, President Lula, President Dilma, who uh, suffered the, directly the underhand methods of the right to topple um, progressive governments, Celso Morin, Fernando Haddad, all the Workers' Party, they did amazing work in defense of Lula, 
in defense of Lula's freedom, I want to recognize you all and thank you all because the whole world was watching and you took Lula's voice and the, and the slogan for Lula's freedom all around the world. So a lot of millions of people around the world are now happier with Lula's freedom. And now we're committed for Lula's freedom forever. Of course, there's a reaction from the right. Of course, there is a rebirth of the far right. Who would have thought so? We were young under authoritarian governments. We used to think that the danger of the far right was something that had been come extinct, that the civilizational instinct of progress, of advancement, of, of achievements would mean that the vast majority of societies would uh, understand progress and see the future in those terms and no longer uh, and no longer fall prey to the threats of the far right. The far right has about 15 percent of the European people's uh, electoral preference. They are far from being the majority and we're not going to allow that in absolutely not in Europe or anywhere else. But perhaps the reason of this rebirth of the far right are the advances, are the progressive advances. It's a reaction in the face of the achievements made by the peoples in terms of reduction of poverty, in the face of the plans to combat poverty in Brazil, the advances that are unstoppable of the, of the equality between men and women, of the homosexual people, the full freedom, individual freedom that many progressive countries have achieved. It's a reaction from the right in the face of the capacity of having global governance, a union, an integration, of international organizations and governments that they can have to eliminate the, for example, the, the tax havens to control more the financial system and for the wealth of the world to be distributed with a little more fairness. This is a reaction that leads to the rebirth of the far right in the face of the advances and the achievements that have been produced in the world in the last 40 years. For this reason, we have to be very much aware, have to be aware and, and clear that this rebirth of the far right, to a large extent, bases its xenophobic theories. We have to call them by their name xenophobic, racist, excluding theories and extremist theories. We have to combat them with the firmness of our principles and the decency of our values. It seems that it's sad how the far right in Europe uh, is rising with the discourse of the threat of immigration in a continent, as happened in, in, the, year, in the United States. Half of the economic growth of the last 40 years in Europe, in Spain included, because of the contribution of immigrants. So the same people that use immigrants and exploit uh, immigrants want to ask voters to vote against immigrants. It's absolutely unconscionable. So principles and values, we have to be very bold and very brave to confront the far right. We cannot explain them, we cannot justify them. We have to confront them face to face because their principles, their policies, as well as being fake, are destructive. For society as a whole, they produce poison, hate, hatred. So they bring forth this idea, which is a plague of the end of coexistence between people the supremacist theories. So we were talking to President Lula today. We are firm in the combat, in the struggle, more affirmative than we are, what we represent, 
as Democrats, as progressives, we aspire to societies that are fairer, where no one is discriminated because of the color of the skin, their origin, their sexual, their sexuality. This is just elementary, and this is about fundamental rights, human rights. We cannot yield on the on this debate. So, thinking about Latin America, this crisis that affects democracy. Because what we have uh, experienced, we've, what we've been witnessing in Bolivia, for instance, nobody would have thought that decades after co consolidating democracies across Latin America and after the end of the coups and the inter military interventions, of the foreign interventions, so we would have the situation of, a, of, a, of the chief of the army to tell the democratically elected president saying, you have to leave power. We cannot uh, uh, be silent. We must denounce what happened in Bolivia as a coup d'etat. If we allow this to happen in Bolivia today, it can happen anywhere. Because unfortunately, since President Trump has uh, been in office, the right the far right uh, rights of Latin Americans feel emboldened, feel stronger, feel supported. They think their moment has arrived of transposing their reactionary values, of reducing and uh, uh, taming the progressive forces, the left. So it's fundamental that the left in Latin America be united in a broad sense. I'm part with Celso, President Dilma, of the Puebla Group. It's a group that brings together uh, leaders from the right, from, from the left, forgive me, in Latin America and Spain. And we uh, want to drive forward the idea that Latin American left should have a common program, a new organization that adds together. Uh, a, a broad Latin American left party without sectarianism, exclus without exclusivity. All the progressive Democrats, left-wingers in Latin America should be together in a single common project. That is the task we have ahead of us. So in the chapter of hopes, there's Mexico, of course, uh, for a few months a decisive country, very important country for our continent, with this huge task of unity, of integration of Latin America. So it will be a guarantee of independence of sovereignty. Nobody must, no one must be fooled. If you want to see your nations independent and sovereign in Latin America, where the interventionism of the United States is stopped. They're constantly trying in Venezuela. They're never sending a message of coexistence, of peace, of unity. What they've always tried is to bring about conflict, interventionism, and not make uh, uh, easier the uh, peaceful coexistence of political forces. So then First Mexico, now Argentina, so onward. It's not easy for them in Argentina. Eh? El, the IMF has never made it easy for anyone. It's like congenital. But we're going to help, we're going to support their government in any way we can. And we must all support Argentina for the progressive government, government uh, should, is able to advance. So Jorge and Alberto. Alberto has so much support, so much sympathy. Maybe he will be one of these leaders that will unite Latin America, that is able to put all the left-wing parties in Latin America, progressive parties, into a common program. Commitment to integration in Latin America, or the unity of Latin America, for this continent to be stronger, more solid, that nobody will dare to intervene in it, will never dare to 
stage coups in this country to be able to control these elites and educate these elites that don't understand that there can be no EU stability in Chile, Ecuador, Colombia, Brazil, anywhere as long as there's so much poverty, so much inequality, poor, uh, rich people that are so rich and poor people that are so poor. So let us be uh, the most principled defenders of, democ of democratic values. These principles that lead us to convince, to debate, to argue in the face of the right that wants to, wants to impose things on us. In a technologically connected world among all of us, where sometimes arguments don't count, no, we say no. Let's make the effort of putting forward ideas, arguments. Let's not, dis let's not waste our progress. The, the reaction against the left, that comes from parties that are against progress. And we must be the parties that are the parties of progress that value new technologies and their potential for social advances, medical scientific advances, democratic advances for a better society. We must be political forces that value and defend the struggle against climate change, which is this new frontier, is to be or not to be of humankind. So if you are a if you are fighting climate change, you are, you are aware of the time that you're experiencing in solidarity with the future generations. And that is a major commitment. So, uh, comrades from the Workers' Party, I know you fought here for decades to see democracy flourish, to see pro-equality policies, to have a president like Lula, a president like Dilma Rousseff. It was a s tough struggle, a difficult struggle. but. We mustn't be uh, tired. We who are from the left, we must never be resigned. We must never feel defeated. We must never feel tired. The new victory is close. It will be better than the previous one. Let us not forget that democracy, just like the left, means fighting and fighting for the left. With Lula, we will continue fighting. And I also say that in in, in Spain, we are war victorious also, and the Spanish government will support the Latin American left. Thank you very much. Now we are going to uh, turn the floor to Dilma Rousseff, former president of Brazil and chairwoman of the Curatorship Council of the Perseu do Foundation. Good afternoon. First of all, I'd like to greet our panelists, the former prime minister of Spain, José Luis Rodríguez Zapatero, the Mercosur Deputy Former Minister of Foreign Relations, our dear companion Tayana, the Secretary of International Relations and Globalization of the Socialist Party from France, Jean-Marc Chemin. I would like to greet all the companions, comrades uh, here in present from the guest parties that were invited to the pre-PT Congress and also my dear fellow Workers' Party's integrants. I believe that we in Latin America, as well as in the whole of the world, are facing a quite uh, severe time. And I say that in terms of the health of world populations. We are going through a period in capitalism in which neoliberalism in its financial perspective is taking over control. And that uh, means 
the kingdom of finance over any production activity, be it industry, services, or agriculture. And that creates the most severe characteristic of the system, which is a brutal concentration of income. And this concentration of income goes through all developed societies, emerging countries, and even regions in the world like Latin America. And here, this is even more perverse because we never reached a level of social well-being that is as full as other developed countries here in Brazil. Um, even in the administrations of Lula and myself, and in Argentina in the former uh, generation policy. I'm not talking about the phase of development that what happened in Latin America. I'm talking about more recent times. So this brutal concentration of income leads to brutal inequality. And inequality hurts also, but not only those sectors where you have the middle class, those that earn their salaries, and it reaches small businesses. It concentrates income in the peak of the pyramid, that is, just in the hand of major financiers. And when you're talking about non-finance companies, uh, for instance, you're talking about uh, a business in the agricultural sector, you have uh, either to work uh, through a bank or you cannot have profit enough. And the rationale for all that is the following. The state has to be reduced to the minimum. The payment of tax is something wrong because uh, paying taxes should be something that those that make more money, those that concentrate more income, would pay. So throughout the world, there is a dramatic reduction of taxes compared to the previous period. And there is a deregulation of banks. Banks can it all. That already led to the crisis in 2008. But inequality continues to be very severe. And it does explain the emergence of some figures internationally. In the United States, a worker today gets the same or less that they got 70 years ago. In Latin America, it's even worse. The level of concentration in this region in the world is very, very huge. The scholar of inequality that is called Piketty says that Brazil is the second worst region in the world in terms of concentration of income. We are only second in terms of income concentration to the Middle East. Here, the 10%, says Piketty, that get more income account for 56% of the national income. In the Middle East is 65, 34%. In Europe, 41% in China, and 48% in the United States. This is data from Piketty's latest book when he studies inequality. A French colleague, by the way. It's interesting to notice that the issue of inequality is structurally connected to democracy. And why is that? Because democracy has always had two traditions. One liberal tradition that is responsible for uh, the division of powers, the rule of law, elections, and the other tradition which is a Republican democratic tradition that is responsible for the concept and practice of popular sovereignty and equality. These two traditions together characterized the emergence of democracy in the world. 
based on struggles against absolutism. In this process, there were times in recent history where they went deeper. And in many countries in the world, there was the social welfare state. However, neoliberalism brought inequality to the whole of the world and brought a vision of democracy that is characterized basically by a new liberal view on the world. And this new liberal view says there is no alternative to neoliberalism going on. The market is always right. And in addition to the market being always right, merit defines the appropriation of income. And merit means the following, complete unawareness with the fact that the inheritance of many countries is responsible for where wealth goes to. And this process is a process that is completely unbalanced and is also characterized by another thing that is quite important. Because they needed to create uh, the new liberal concept as the dominant trait, they also found the need to have consensus between to have someone in between right and left. You have to have a center party and therefore you eliminate any contradictions in politics. The center always defends that a country that is completely unequal and inequality is everywhere in the world cannot have policies that counterpose this inequality. So the demonization of uh, extremes is very interesting because polarization is something important. We live in a country in which the National Institute of Geography and Statistics says has a concentration of income. It, it, it's even different than what Piketty says. It, it, the IBGS says that our concentration of income means that the poor get only 0.8% of the national income and the 10 richers get 43%. This is polarization. Where is the absence of polarization? If you are excluding from the wealth of your country people, how come you don't have a polarization policy? How come policies are not presented to encompass different views about which way you want the country to follow, which way you want the country to develop, to improve the lives of everyone? This difference is not given by the will of those that are in power, but basically because of the circumstances that we have. How can you, in Brazil, not polarize, given the fact that people want to tax the unemployed to finance employment? This is absurd a country that has the largest, the largest reserve of the world in terms of forests and has a policy to dismantle all policies that came before this administration. Ours was a time where we decreased deforestation the most, but they are dismantling auditing, inspections, regulations. They are putting an end to all instruments to fight deforestation. And they even challenge the results that are seen by satellite. And then they deny polarization. There is a polarization of climate in Brazil. There is polarization with regard to Petrobras in Brazil. 
Petrobras is the largest oil company in the world, and there is polarization with regard to Petrobras. Some want to break it apart and sell it in pieces. They say privatize it. There is no money in Brazil enough to buy Petrobras, just buy a single investor. So you denationalize it. You sell it to other countries. How can we accept this is not polarization when they are treating universities as they are? The Minister of Education comes forward to say that Brazilian universities are places to grow wheat. By making these accusations, they should be obliged to prove it. Perhaps he is the one that knows where the weed is. How come we can accept this damage to the sovereignty of our country? But that, I have to say, is not only for Brazil. In Brazil, in fact, neoliberalism came late compared to the remainder of Latin America. Until 2003, they were never able to implement fully the deregulation of the job market, the precarization of the job market. They were never able to pass this horrible pension reform that we have today. Today, the poor will never get retired in this country. They were never able to sell state-owned companies. Banco do Brasil, Caixa Econômica e Federal were not privatized, and not even the BNDS, at least while we were in power. We did not let them. They were not able to touch our companies. But now, after they lost for elections, they went for a coup and I was moved away from presidency without any crime of responsibility. Well, because they could not have the coup and then Lula be voted by president, Lula was arrested. But you know, the severity of this whole thing is not only Lula being arrested, which was a crime against Brazilian justice. The worst severity, and I think it's important to be mentioned, is that in all cases of liberalism, uh, you always have to find someone that is guilty. For the Americans, it is the Mexican wall. For Europe, it is perhaps the immigrants. And for Brazil, it was the Workers' Party. You know, if you have to blame someone, blame the Workers' Party. This is a process that they started by trying to destroy us by means of Loper. But with that, they destroyed also countries from other ranges of the left and the center. And thus, we had the emergence of the extreme right, and not only in Brazil. And it is only when neoliberalism started to have other connections, uh, they started to be closer to far right. And people are discouraged today. People do not have a perspective of getting better in life. And this discouragement leaves uh, possibilities for the far right. It was not because of this that it appeared in Brazil. The far right uh, was created because they destroyed uh, the parties of center, center left, center right, and left. Not because they wanted uh, it necessarily, but it was a consequence of uh, their actions. This process led to a favorable view to, to 
this extreme right parties. We are different from some places of the world in some things. But neo-fascism is in government today. They had a victory. And the victory shows the true character of neoliberalism, which is excludent, that wants to concentrate income. It is anti-social, anti-popular, and particularly in the case of Brazil, and I think in the whole of Latin America, it is a need to go back to Latin America, to its original roots of subservience, to become an area of the world in which geopolitics is just the yard of the United States. And we see what is going on today. We have on one side the strengths of Latin American peoples reacting, reacting in Chile, in Ecuador. But it's interesting that they are reacting in face of a threat that is reaching the whole of the community as if it were a trigger. If it is a trigger to something that is going to hurt the whole of the population. And so you see, you start to see mass movements insurging against this process of sheer inequality of the region. And we also have a resume to democracy in Argentina, electing Alberto Fernandez and our dear Christina Kirchner as presidents and vice. And when we have Mexico electing Obrador, a Mexico that was so close to the United States before, and now Obrador is a lot closer to God. And now we have the severe situation, which is the resume of traditional coups, as was done with Evo Morales. Evo Morales was in practice winning the elections, not by 0.6%. He won the election by 40.6%. And Evo Morales is this. It is going back to the traditional coups, the interference of the United States. Another very, very severe thing that we are seeing in Latin America. It's not what people can think or not think about Venezuela. is the absurd of what they did to Venezuela, the siege against Venezuela for years. Uh, doing the same as what they did to Cuba, preventing, sieging, preventing Cuba to develop, impoverishing the population, trying to change the politics. This process in Latin America is something that we are aware of. And in recent years of popular administrations in Latin America served for one thing, First, we are very, very close to one another. We share the awareness and the importance of regional integration. It's not only commercial integration, infrastructure, culture, and politics. We have become friends. And this is something that uh, is heritage that political leaderships have to follow. They must go beyond specific national problems and look at the region as a whole more broadly. And that is our region, a region that for years and years uh, that had its back to each other. What something that our foreign minister Amorim, that he is responsible for, is to have a policy of building uh, the closer and closer ties between Latin American countries. 
not just the Mercosur, not just UNASUR, not just the CELAC, the, com the community of Latin American states. It's the ability of coexistence, of distributing among ourselves help, concern, and solidarity. This is what allows and the former Prime Minister Zapatero is right. That is what allows the, the Puebla group to, just like the Sao Paulo Forum, to have an importance in the structuring of relations between ourselves here in Latin America. We must be fully aware that Brazil needs Latin America it's not Latin America that needs Brazil. Brazil will always need Latin America to be a free country and a developed country. This is the consciousness, this is the awareness that means that we have enormous joy when Argentina, Alberto Fernandez and Cristina Kirchner won the election. This is the light that has to exist at the end of the tunnel. So maybe now the light is halfway through the tunnel. We haven't finished the we haven't finished the left the tunnel yet, but Argentina is pointing the way forward, which is a democratic struggle through elections is not just a struggle against neo-fascism, it's a struggle against neoliberalism and inequality. In this country that is so unequal that we know well that there were 21 years of dictatorship and 300 odd years of slavery. So this is the country that is not polarized because somebody wants it to be that way. It is polarized because, unfortunately, that is the inheritance of a blind elite, oligarchical elite, that has always espoused and defended its own interests against the interests of its people.